Hello and welcome. My name is Camille Frank Olson. On behalf of all those involved with the BYU New Testament Commentary Series, I'd like to introduce you to our next presenter. Michael Rhodes is one of the co-authors for the commentary on the Epistle to the Hebrews. He's currently working on the Second Corinthians commentary as well. And previously, he and Richard Draper co-authored the volume on Revelation and also 1 Corinthians. Brother Rhodes' research interests are also occupying him in work on a scientific paper dealing with exoplanets, which are planets around other stars. He's been known to competitively race his Corvette at the Miller Sports Park and enjoys spending time with his grandchildren, walking up Provo Canyon with his dog, and glorying in the majesty of his beard. Brother Rhodes. In this paper, I will be examining those passages in the Epistle to the Hebrews that are used to support doctrines unique to Latter-day Saints. I will not deal with any other passages in Hebrews that Latter-day Saints understand in the same way as scholars, theologians, and churchmen from other Christian denominations do. In the Epistle to the Hebrews, there are only three passages where Latter-day Saint interpretations are unique two from chapter 11 and one from chapter 12. In my treatment of each of these passages, I will begin with two versions of the text, the King James Version of our new rendition from the soon to be published Epistle to the Hebrews by Richard D. Draper and Michael D. Rhodes. And this is the latest volume of the Brigham Young University New Testament Commentary series. My comments in this paper are based on our work in that volume. So the first passage, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, King James Version. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained a witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. New rendition. By faith, Abel offered a greater sacrifice to God than Cain for which he was commended as righteous, God himself commending him for the gifts. Moreover, by faith, although he has died, he still continues to speak. Chapter 11 of Hebrews begins with the well-known definition of faith. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It then continues on for 39 more verses, citing numerous examples of faith in action, that are illustrated by men and women of the Old Testament who are able to accomplish many like righteous works and please God. I will focus here on verse 11.4, which describes Abel's offering up an acceptable sacrifice to God through faith and God's resulting commendation of Abel for his righteousness. The prophet Joseph Smith interpreted, it, interpreted this to mean that Abel knew of the plan of redemption, stating, it is said that Abel himself obtained witness that he was righteous, and certainly God spoke to him. Indeed, it was said that God talked with him, and if he did, would he not, seeing he was righteous, deliver to him the whole plan of the gospel, and is not the gospel the news of redemption? Additional insight comes from another statement made by Joseph Smith. He asked, how did the author of Hebrews know so much about Abel? And why should he talk about his speaking after he was dead? That Abel spoke after he was dead must be by being sent down out of heaven to administer. In another sermon, Joseph Smith elaborated saying, he magnified the priesthood which was conferred upon him and he died a righteous man and therefore has become an angel of God by receiving his body from the dead, holding still the keys of this dispensation and was sent down from heaven unto the author of Hebrews, and to minister consoling words, to commit unto him a knowledge of the mystery of godliness. For Joseph Smith, then, the author of Hebrews had an additional knowledge about Abel, because he had first-hand interactions with Abel through heavenly ministration. Thus, Joseph Smith sees this verse as supporting the Latter-day Saint doctrine that the gospel plan has been available since the time of Adam. 
Turning now to the second passage, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 40. The King James Version, God having provided some better things for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. New rendition. Since God has provided something better with regard to us, so that without us they could not be made perfect. This verse focuses on God's promise to the faithful people in the Old Testament that he had something better than the old Mosaic covenant. That something better was that they would reach perfection through the assistance of Christian saints. General authorities have used this verse as part of the scriptural foundation for the church's doctrine concerning work for the dead, focusing most particularly upon the phrase, they without us should not be made perfect. This idea is closely paraphrased in Doctrine and Covenants 128.15, where the phrase should not is replaced by the word cannot. Further, this modern scripture also adds that the living cannot be made perfect without doing the necessary work for the dead. Joseph Smith expanded on this idea in a discourse he gave on April 7, 1844, wherein he stated, the greatest responsibility in this world that God has laid upon us is to seek after our dead. The apostle says they without us cannot be made perfect, for it is necessary that the seeming power should be in our hands to seal our children and our dead for the fullness of the dispensation of times. At another time, the prophet linked Hebrews 11.40 with Malachi 4.6, stating, I would refer you to the scriptures where the subject is manifest that without us, they could not be made perfect, nor we without them, the fathers without the children, nor the children without the fathers. I wish you to understand the subject, for it is important, and if you will receive it, this is the spirit of Elijah, that we redeem our dead and connect ourselves with our fathers, which are in heaven, and seal up our dead to come forth in the first resurrection. Throughout the Journal of Discourses, many general authorities also cite Hebrews 11.40 to emphasize the importance of temple work. For example, President Wood, Wilfred Woodruff stated, The eyes of all the hosts of heaven are over us. The eyes of God himself and the eyes of all the prophets and apostles who have ever lived in the flesh are watching this people. They know that they are not, neither can they be, made perfect without you. <coughs> and they fully understand that we cannot be made perfect without them. Because of the support this verse gives to the doctrine of temple work, many other Latter-day Saint leaders have referenced it, although emphasizing that is that it is the saints also cannot be made perfect without doing work on behalf of the dead. One example comes from Elder David A. Bednar, who stated, we have the covenant responsibility to search out our ancestors and provide for them the saving ordinances of the gospel. They without us should not be made perfect, and neither can we without our dead be made perfect. His words illustrate how general authorities use the idea of covenant responsibility <coughs> to promote temple work. President Russell M. Nelson took the idea a bit further by referencing the Greek that stands behind the verse. The Greek term from which perfect was translated was a form of teleos, thus the perfection that the Savior envisions for us much more, is much more than errorless performance. It is the eternal expectation as expressed by the Lord in his great intercessory prayer to his Father, that we might be made perfect, that we might be made perfect and be able to dwell with him in the eternities ahead. The work we do does not necessarily change the spiritual nature of those who have died, but it does enable them to have access to the ordinances that allow them to reach their full potential. Elder Mark E. Peterson, also citing this verse, explained why the dead cannot be made perfect without us. The requirement of the Lord is that each couple must be married for eternity, and each child must be bound to his or her own parents by the power of the holy priesthood. This process must be carried back into the past as far as we can obtain genealogical information to justify it. This is in addition to the baptisms we may perform for our dead. If we fail to do this work, we place our own salvation in question. In the same light, President Ezra Taft Benson noted, 
the work we are performing at here has direct relationship to the work over there. <clears throat> Someday you will know that there are ordinances performed over there too, in order to make the vicarious work which you do effective. It will all be done under the authority and the power of the priesthood of God. Clearly, Hebrews 11.40 has an important place in Latter-day Saint theology, highlighting as it does the crucial doctrine of vicarious work for the dead. Let's turn now to the final passage, the third passage, Hebrews 12.9. King James Version. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjugation unto the Father of spirits and live? New rendition. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our body who corrected us, and he treated them with respect. Should we not even more so submit ourselves to the Father of our spirits and live? The phrase Father of our spirits is arresting because it reveals something of the understanding of God that the author of Hebrews had. God is the author of all human life and thus stands not only as the creative, but also the procreative force behind it. Normally in both the Old and New Testament, being a child of God was not a natural quality or state, but was brought about by the divine action of grace through which the child entered into God's spiritual family and became an heir of eternal life. In this passage, however, the author of Hebrews looks more broadly, seeing God as the originator, not just of the person's earthly life, but of his or her spirit life as well. He appears to be following the Apostle Paul, who referred to the one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. From Ephesians chapter 4, verse 6. The words of these two church leaders suggest a paternal bond that, from a Latter-day Saint perspective, originated in the premortal sphere of the Father's eternal plan. Many general authorities have quoted Hebrews 12.9 as a proof text for humankind's premortal existence as spirit children of God. An ex excellent example of its use is the statement by President Monson in which he said, the Lord has declared that the spirit and the body are the soul of man, DNC 8815. <clears throat> Thus it is the spirit which is the offspring of God. The writer of Hebrews refers to him as the father of spirits. The spirits of all men are literally his begotten sons and daughters, DNC 7624. The proclamation on the family also emphasizes this eternal truth. All human beings, male and female, are created in the image of God. Each is a beloved spirit, son or daughter of heavenly parents. And as such, each has a divine nature and destiny. In the pre-mortal realm, spirits, sons and daughters knew and worship God as their eternal father. In summary then, these three verses from Hebrews were used by Joseph Smith and subsequent general authorities to introduce and clarify three Latter-day Saint doctrines that are unique to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. One, the gospel of Jesus Christ was known from the time of Adam onward, though lost during periods of apostasy. Two, our Father in heaven is the father of our pre-existent spirits. Each of us is literally his son or daughter. Three, the vicarious work of performing gospel ordinances for the dead provides the opportunity for salvation and exaltation for all of God's children.